Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to speak of? What would you like to speak of this evening on this anonymous telephone program? This program, which is designed to focus all together on this most, most wonderful book, the Bible. The one book in the whole world, the only book in the whole world uh, that came right from the lips of God himself. Almighty God, who spoke in this and brought this magnificent creation into existence is the same one who has written the Bible word by word. Uh, he used uh, various uh, men of God in the past to actually be the scribe, to take the dictation and write it down. But what was finally uh, in the original uh, languages of the Bible uh, every word and every letter of every word, every sentence came right from the mouth of God. And therefore, it has to be a very, very important document. It has to be superb, superbly important, and it is. It actually is the supreme law of God that God has given us in order that we might know how we are to live, how we are, how we relate to God, and what the consequence of our life is as we relate to God. Oh my, it's got heavy, heavy, heavy importance in our lives, far beyond what most people have any idea of. But uh, this is what we talk about on this program. We try to get better acquainted with the Bible and try to encourage one another to become more and more interested in it and ready to be obedient to it. That's the bottom line, that we want to be obedient to what God declares to us. Now, this is a very interesting question that comes from Uganda in Africa uh, from a listener, and it has to do with obedience also, that he... Uh, is asking a question, why did Jesus keep the women from touching him immediately after the resurrection, telling them he had not yet gone to his father? And yet, a little later, he invited the men, the disciples, when he were with them, to put, uh, he invited Thomas, for example, to put his finger in the nail prints of his hand and in the sword wound in his side, which he still bore as uh, even though he had risen from the dead and uh, and so the question is was why was he picking on the, on a woman because we read in in John chapter 20 that Mary Magdalene who was a uh, one of his uh, followers and who uh, loved him as all kinds of people loved him very dearly uh, she I was just beside herself with with sorrow because her beloved master had been crucified and now she had gone to on this early Sunday morning had come to pay respects to uh, the grave site where he had been buried uh, and and he is he was no longer in the tomb and so she suspected that someone had stolen his body, insult upon injury, how terrible. And so she was stricken with sorrow. And then she turned around and she uh, thought she uh, saw the gardener there in the garden that was uh, the place where the tomb was. And, uh, and uh, she asked him, what have you, they done with the body of Jesus? And then Jesus said unto her, Mary, Mary. And he opened her spiritual eyes so that she recognized that indeed this is Jesus, the resurrected Jesus talking to her. And so she did precisely what any individual who loved Jesus dearly, as so many people of his disciples and and uh, and the sisters of Lazarus and Mary Magdalene and so on did. 
uh, she uh, fell down to worship him, taking him by the feet uh, to worship him. And uh, Jesus said something very interesting. He said, uh, touch me not. This is verse 17 of John chapter 20, verse 17, where God records this for us. Touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and my and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Now, why did he tell Mary Magdalene, don't touch me? Uh, and yet there were other women who uh, uh, greeted him, and they touched him. We read that in Matthew. There were uh, the he invited the disciples to touch him, and now why was he picking on Mary Magdalene? Well, here God is using this as an opportunity to illustrate to us God's salvation plan. Mary Magdalene here is a representative of every true believer. She, in this particular incident, is is a picture, a portrait, of what a true believer is, someone who dearly loves the Lord Jesus, dearly wants to do his will, wants to be with him forevermore. And what is the eternal, final destination of every true believer? It is to be with Christ forevermore and to actually live with him as the bride of Christ. Now, don't think of a human marriage now, uh, but the fact is that, that in order to indicate the enormous intimacy that exists between every true believer, and it's a great multitude that God has in mind, God uses the picture of being married to him. As a matter of fact, we read in Revelation that when uh, when uh, Christ comes, we will sit down at the at the wedding feast of the bride and the lamb. We will be the bride there, and He is the lamb. He is the uh, the bridegroom. The marriage will be completed. Well, now here is Mary Magdalene. Uh, really being a picture representing all those who are eventually going to be with Christ as his bride. And and uh, she, when, of course, uh, has an attitude right here, oh my, uh, I, I would want to, I, I'm so glad that you're alive and, and oh, you're my master and I love you and so on. And then Jesus said, Touch me not. Now, that is not accidental language. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, God there is talking about uh, marriage. In, in 1 Corinthians 7, he has a lot to say about marriage. And he starts right out in verse 1 and talks about two people who are... are uh, uh, becoming interested, romantically interested in each other. And he uses the language, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And then goes on to say that in order to avoid fornication, it would be good for them to marry. Because uh, and he has in mind romantic touching, touching that has to lead to, that will eventually lead to marriage. Now, after marriage, of course, a man and a woman are, are one flesh, and so, of course, uh, they were, their bodies will be united together all together. But before marriage, no, no, because uh, God has designed us. He knows the, uh, the uh, body chemistry that he has put within us, and he knows what romantic touching will do insofar as stimulating desires that really ought to be expressed and and brought to fruition only after marriage and not before marriage. And so God is, Christ is using that figure. He's looking at Mary Magdalene as a picture of all true believers who eventually will be the bride of Christ uh, eternally. And he's saying, touch me not. In other words, Mary, 
uh, it's not time for that celestial marriage that is going to come uh, uh, between me and all true believers represented by you. Uh, you see, I haven't gone to my father yet. Now, why did he say that? Because earlier on, he had indicated that unless I go to my father, uh, then the Holy Spirit will not be sent. And why did the Holy Spirit have to be sent? Well, because the Holy Spirit, the sending of the Holy Spirit, would initiate, it would begin God's whole program of worldwide evangelization. The Holy Spirit, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that did occur about 50 days later, uh, that that is uh, the uh, uh, time when God began to save uh, people uh, all over the world, beginning right there in Jerusalem that Pentecost afternoon. Fifty days later, as we read in Acts 2, he saved about 3,000 people. And so he is saying effectively, uh, as we're uh, reading this in the light of all the other information we get from the Bible, Mary, uh, I love you dearly. You are, uh, you like our, every other true believer, are the bride of Christ. But the marriage cannot be consummated until everyone who is to become saved has become saved. And in order for all of this to happen, it means that the, I have to go to my Father. I'm going to ascend back into heaven. And then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And then that would begin the, God's program of evangelization. And... Uh, and so all of that has to happen. And, and as a matter of fact, there's still a couple of thousand years of history that still lies ahead of us that he didn't say that, of course, but we know that because of our knowledge of all that the Bible teaches. There's about 2,000 years of history that still has to go by before our marriage will be consummated as I have become the bridegroom of every, every single true believer who has ever come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But now, Mary, then he said, you go and tell. You go to the disciples and tell them uh, that I'm going to meet them in, in Galilee. In other words, you get busy and start declaring an, whatever you can understand of the gospel. And that is what we do should be doing. We all uh, who are true believers are a Mary Magdalene. We are, uh, we're walking in her shoes. We uh, have to wait for the end of the world, for the completion of our celestial marriage with Christ. But in the meanwhile, we are to get busy and tell it forth the gospel, send the gospel out into all the world. Well, thank you, Uganda, for that very, very uh, uh, interesting and, and significant question. And once we understand it, you see, uh, following the biblical rules that Christ spoke in parables, then we see how it fits right into God's whole salvation plan. But now shall we take our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Okay. I'd just like to know why you call God a merciful God when he's going to send millions, if not billions, of people to hell, no matter how good and uh, how they interpret the Bible and how they live. That's my first question. My second question, I'll wait for that. Well, you know, the fact is... Uh, who's got the problem? Does God have the problem or do we have the problem? Why should God be merciful to anyone? God has a real problem. The law of God, and God is under the law of God, and the law of God stipulates that if anybody rebels against God, that's called sin, then there is a penalty that God must assess. He cannot set that aside. He can't say, I'm a merciful God, I'm a loving God, uh, and I just can't bear to carry out the, uh, the uh, 
the law as it stipulates that there is to be eternal damnation as payment for sin. Uh, he, God cannot do that. As a matter of fact, the Bible does indicate the fact that he has to send people to hell is, uh, is a terrible trauma to God. Christ wept over Jerusalem. Uh, God says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so it's, but it's, it's God's hands, and I'm, I'm saying this very carefully, are absolutely tied. He cannot be just merciful to the human race. He cannot. Now, however, in order for him to be merciful to anybody and, and somehow figure out uh, how maybe that person won't go to hell, it means that God had to find someone to make the payment demanded by the law of God. And that payment is eternal damnation. And so God himself, in an act of love, in an act of mercy that we cannot understand at all, it is so sublime, it is so great, it is so wonderful, so marvelous, God, Christ himself, uh, or the Father, first of all, uh, uh, named those that God wanted to somehow provide uh, an answer for, uh, even at the enormous cost that it would cost God to do this. And he gave those people to the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus had to take every dug dirty, ugly sin of each of these individuals upon himself and be found guilty and actually be sentenced to the equivalent punishment of, of they, these individuals spending an eternity in hell. And you talk about love or mercy that Christ would do it for even one, and he has done it for a great multitude which no man can number. Now, uh, he didn't have to do it for anybody. There was no obligation uh, but once the law of God was written and it stipulated that he had to be the Christ and he had to do this, then he had to faithfully do that. And so God is super merciful. The whole question is, now God has told us about this and he's told us that we that there, uh, there is a hope for each human being. We don't know who the ones are that are elected, but anyone can possibly have been one of the elected. Only God knows that. But he commands us now to be obedient. He commands us to try to do God's will and, and wait upon God and, 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 and beg God for his mercy, for his, for his love. And it's possible that I too, if I'm not saved, can become saved because God assures us that right today, there is, and this is absolutely trustworthy, a great multitude, which no man can number, are being saved. And everyone that is being saved is a product of an enormously merciful and loving God that is beyond our imagination that he would so be. Okay, I spoke to priests, pastors, theologians, all of them, and they talked until they were blue in the face. And I consider myself an atheist. I really don't believe there really is something. There's something going on, but we can't understand it. But well, the God can. Himself, Christ Himself, I cannot believe that. But since there is no proof, and that's you know, there's, there's no doubt about it. There actually is no proof of God or Jesus or Mary or nobody. How do you deal with that when you actually have well, no it's, tangible it's, proof? Well, uh, uh, of course, you know, every human being has to deal with this problem. God tells us, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know you from Adam, but I can tell you this, that you are a human being, and you have been created in the image of God, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, and God's law, to some degree, is written on your heart way deep down. We're far, uh, it may be so submerged and so uh, hidden in your, in your uh, psyche, 
uh, psyche that you you don't even realize it's there. But you know there is a God you have to answer to. Every evolutionist, every atheist knows this, that there is a God. That's why some of the most brilliant minds in the world are atheists, because they know there is a God. And if there is a God, they have to answer to that God. And that is absolutely unacceptable. And so you have two possibilities uh, to, uh, to how to live with that, because we have to live with that knowledge whether we like it or not. We can, we can f try to find a religion or a gospel of some kind that, that claims they have an answer how I can be reconciled to God in spite of my sins. And that's why some people become Buddhists or Hindus or Baptists or Methodists or Roman Catholics or whatever it is. That's one, one solution. Another solution is I can maybe deny altogether that such a God exists. I'll just deny it entirely. I, I absolutely cannot uh, even uh, bring that into my consciousness at all and, and hope that maybe uh, it, it'll all go away. But the fact is, it doesn't change the fact. It simply allows me to be able to, uh, to live out my life with some complacency and with some security uh, because I am trusting in what I think is the answer. But it doesn't change the fact that there is a God. Now think of this for a moment. Look at creation. Here's a little mosquito. A mosquito, they've learned recently, has a whole breathing mechanism. Now, how in the world did that mosquito come into existence with that breathing mechanism? Over there is a goldfish. Over there is a, a, a stingray. Over there is a, a, a jellyfish and with all of its curiosity, curious things. The world is just loaded with evidence. There has to be some kind of a designer. If you were going to uh, have a new house or build a table or build a lamp or something, you'd first have to design it. And then you'd have to find the materials and you'd have to carefully put it together. And finally, it would, take, it would come into existence. Well, here we have a world that is infinitely complex, infinitely complex, and it has to have some kind of a master designer, someone who, who has made all of this. And every, every evolutionist knows that. And yet in their, in their absolute rebellion, and because it is so terrible to, to think that I might have to face a God, they choose this very strange idea of evolution, which doesn't make any sense at all. That all of these multitudinous millions and billions of, of creature forms of one kind, that they adapted themselves and were able to come and were able to uh, uh, come into existence the way they are. There's no way that's possible and yet they rigorously uh, hold on to it because if they let go it means they have to admit there's a God that means I gotta face judgment and that means uh, oh I, I can't accept that I I gotta stick with this crazy idea of mine that that uh, uh, this all came into being over billions of years somehow Do you believe that or even think about the Bible has been around for thousands of, thousands of years, written in Hebrew and Greek. Now, I believe that I'm, a lot of people thought the way I am, thinking, like, what's really going on? Well, we have to scare man and keep him in order. That's when the churches came in. Don't you believe that the Bible got twisted over thousands of years? It's just a made-up thing just to keep man in order. Well, that's, that's in order. well, that's what you want to believe, of course, because if you could destroy the earth, the credibility of the Bible, and my, my, it's, it's, a, it's, it's amazing today, and really not amazing, as the newspapers and the periodicals and the statements of, are being made by various people, and uh, invariably it is 
a statement to discredit the authority of the Bible. Because if you can destroy the, the credibility and the authority of the Bible, then I don't have to believe there is a God. And then if I don't have to believe there is a God, I don't have to worry about my sin. I don't have to worry about the judgment day. So that, again, is another ploy. It's just along, alongside the ploy of evolution or atheism. Uh, that uh, that we don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Now, I happen to be a fairly uh, avid student of the Bible. I've been in it for, for many, many, many decades. And I'll tell you, I am absolutely um, astounded at what I find in the Bible and how accurate it is and how it never contradicts itself. Oh, it's written so that it's very easy to find contradictions. But the more I study it, the more I find that it all harmonizes in a most beautiful way. Even though uh, God wrote it as complex as it is and, over, and prepared it over a period of, of about 1,500 years uh, uh, using various scribes. Uh, but the fact is, uh, the Bible is is a is there's no book like it in the world there's no book you can go to and no absolutely this book has no error in it and in the original language that's what we can say of it now the translation may have an error here or there because the translate translators were not inspired but we can by god's mercy we can go back to the original Greek or the original Hebrew of the Old Testament and we can check it out. And, and, and again and again, we find it all harmonizes in a very, very wonderful way. Like it could never happen if it had been written by man. Never, never, never could we be, find the consistency between Genesis and Ezekiel and Matthew and Revelation and Amos and, and uh, that in, in idea uh, or truth after truth, that it's always consistent, always the same message. Once we understand how God wrote the Bible and, how, uh, and what his overall plan is, then it all begins to open up to us like a beautiful flower. And, you know, it's the only book that has made, uh, made uh, pronouncements hundreds and thousands of years before they took place, and they did it take place right exactly the way the Bible predicted it, and no other book has ever done that. But now we have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to open forum. Uh, good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I would like you to uh, take a look at Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, yes. And verses 3 through 5, please. 3 through 5. Let's read that. There we read... Daniel 5, verse 3. Uh, now, the, the occasion is, is that the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, is, the year is um, 539 B.C. We know that from a lot of other information. And uh, he is uh, being assaulted by the Medo-Persian king Cyrus, whose name also is Darius. And, uh, and, but yet he is so convinced that he, that Babylon is altogether secure, that he, uh, is having a great feast, uh, and, and they're, they brought out all the golden vessels that were in, that his father, uh, had taken out of the temple, uh, uh, in, fi in 587 BC when, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. And now they're drinking toasts in these and, and, uh, actually, actually, uh, ridiculing the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Bible. And now something happens. 
And uh, then uh, we read in verse 3, they brought out the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon this plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And uh, then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against the other. And the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his head, neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. And then finally, and we won't uh, later on, we read that Daniel was brought in and he read the interpretation. And the interpretation was simply that this was going to be the end of Belshazzar. In fact, that night he was slain and the Medes and the Persians took over the king the uh, the city of Babylon and that was the end of the nation of Babylon and it was a time when the medio persian king came into its highest flower uh, and existed for many years until Alexander the Great and what is your question in my question it was back in uh, verse number 5 where it says against the candlestick um is there the spiritual meaning here? Are these the actual? Uh, are, they are the actual vessels that were in the that were in the temple, and uh, against the the candlestick in the temple, across from the lampstand, was the table of showbread. And so, were these actual vessels um, on the table of showbread? And if so, they were across from the lampstand in the temple itself as well. Well, Is that right? excuse me, it doesn't speak here about the table of showbread at all. It simply no. mentions a candlestick as well as the vessels that they drank from. And the vessels represent, ultimately, represent uh, the you know, true believers uh, who are identified all together with the Lord Jesus Christ. And But here he is... Uh, he is uh, blaspheming God for with a passion as he is uh, praising uh, his heathen gods uh, for the victory that they uh, that he believed they gave Babylon in, the, in, 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 able, in that enabled them to conquer Jerusalem uh, uh, 70 years earlier no it was about 48 years earlier that they conquered Babylon or conquered Jerusalem and uh, and uh, uh, the candle now the candlestick was there that 's very interesting you know i don 't know the full spiritual meaning of this, but I do know the candlestick has to do with the gospel, the light of the gospel, and god 's gospel is being unfolded here. It was part of god 's plan in the unfolding of the gospel message that the media Persian a kingdom would uh, conquer Babylon, and this was a picture, incidentally, of of the end of the world when uh, when uh, Christ, typified by Cyrus, king of Persia, uh, would conquer, uh, uh, would finally conquer Satan, typified by the king of of Babylon, and uh, and the whole world would be under the rule of Christ, and uh, and so the candlestick at least is a is a uh, an indicator that this is all an integral part of God's gospel plan. That these things are going to develop this way. Um, then against the candlestick, that, that against the candlestick, that's not telling us to look um, across from the candlestick. And in here, it was a man's hand, and in the and in the temple, it was a table of showbread. That yeah. wouldn't uh, that wouldn't be a, a comparison there. You don't think? I do not believe so. I, I, it might be, but I but I don't believe no. so. 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, is there anything in the Bible that talks about uh, men having a vasectomy, uh, a married couple, even though they've had children? Uh, Excuse me. Is there anything in the Bible about what, uh, what in the marriage relationship? Uh, yeah, in a marriage relationship of the man having a vasectomy. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and not directly, of course. You know, it's interesting that the world went on for 13,000 years. That's a long time. And we are the first generation that knows anything about birth control as we know it today. Up until our generation, the only way of avoiding birth is by abstinence. That was the only certain way. The, the, some people tried the rhythm method, but that was not uh, trustworthy altogether at all. The only real trustworthy way was abstinence. And so uh, the... Uh, the in our day suddenly as wickedness is multiplying all over at a rate that is just uh, uh, it, it, you just shake your head in awe as you as we see the increase in sexual pornography and and uh, all the other ugly things that are going on in, in wickedness and included in that is birth control as well as what follows if the birth control was not satisfactory or, or still missed, then you can always have a, an abortion. And so that's all part of the same cup of tea. And, uh, and all of it is in direct rebellion against God. Because God declared, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Noah was told, Adam and Eve were told that. And then later on, Noah, after the flood of Noah, of Noah's day that occurred 7,000 years ago. Noah was told that, be fruitful and multiply. And the Bible clearly teaches that children are a blessing of the Lord. The, uh, that is the highest uh, goal and the highest uh, uh, blessing of the marriage relationship. And, and, uh, and on the other hand, the Bible teaches that it is Satan who wants to kill. Remember, he killed the children in Bethlehem. He killed the children in uh, Egypt when when they were the nation of Israel was multiplying too fast, and so they were killing off all the the boy uh, babies of the Israelites just before Israel went out of uh, Egypt back there uh, in 1447 B.C. And so uh, now Satan has been working. And and he, in the lives of all kinds of people, he's instilled the idea, and because man's heart is wicked, they buy it very quickly, that birth control is a very good idea, because then I can have my children when I'm more qualified, I'm, uh, we have... We can, we're older or we aren't so busy with the schooling or whatever else. And so mankind has decided they are wiser than God. God is, you must remember, no baby is conceived in anybody's womb unless God, the Holy Spirit, actually gives that, that baby life. And it begins right at conception. God has to be active in the conception of every single child like he is in, in the uh, conception of every animal. Uh, God, this is God's role in caring for this universe. Now, mankind has said, aha, uh -huh. we, they don't think it out quite as crassly as this, but effectively this is what they've done. We have figured it out. We are wiser than God. Uh, God may, uh, uh, it may be uh, dangerous for our health if, if my wife has another baby or we, uh, we're not qualified right now to begin to have children, but we can exercise birth control and we can keep God 
uh, from uh, from uh, 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 giving a conception as we engage in the sexual union that we are pro- which we properly can do as husband and wife, and uh, and so it is another evidence of the enormous rebellion that is exi- going on today against the law of God. I feel that even though a married couple um, married 20 years, had five, six, seven, eight children, and they both decide later on in their marriage that uh, now we want to raise these children, um, and a married couple still in love, um, that yeah. it's still up to the Lord to decide. What, what, let, me ask, let me ask you the question. Is God in control of your life? Yes. All right. Does he always do the best for us? Yes. All right. I, is it, is it uh, you don't dare trust that God knows best whether you should have another baby or not? You, you don't really think God uh, can make that decision more wisely than you and your wife can make that decision? Yes, I, I think he can, yes. Well, then uh, yeah. then why don't you leave it to God? That's the way God has set it up. <laughs> you, you see the box you get into? Yes, you do. <laughs> you you well, that, really do. Yeah, you do. Well, that's, that's those are the facts yeah. of the case. Those are the facts of the case. I like to say it another way. Sometimes someone will come to me and they'll say, Oh, my, the Lord blessed us with six children already, or five, or three, or whatever it may be. And and now it looks like I'm going, I'm pregnant again, this dear woman says. And, uh, oh, my, maybe, oh, and you, you can just uh, see her brain going, oh, should we maybe had practice birth control or something? And I like mm-hmm. to say to them, well, now, now, let's, let's, I'll tell you what. Suppose God came to you t- tonight and said, look, my dear soul, you already have six children. And that's a, you're, it's difficult. You, you're not in real good health and your husband doesn't earn that much money and it's really difficult. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to take one or maybe two of your children. Which ones would you like me to take so that you'll have a smaller family and, and that way it'll be easier for you? Mm-hmm. All right, contemplate that. And, and right, immediately right. say, oh, no, wait a minute. I love these children. I wouldn't want the Lord to take any one of them. Well, okay. Did God give you that love? Did he give you the sustaining power to care for the half a dozen? Can he give you the sustaining power to care for one more? Uh, you see, the only way to live, the only way to live is do it God's way. God is infinite in his wisdom. We in our little human minds sometimes think we're so smart. And it is true. We are influenced by those around us. It, 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 it kind of hits us a little bit if we have a half a dozen children and, and we go into a restaurant and, and uh, to get a meal. First of all, it's going to cost quite a bit of money. And then the person in the booth next to us looks over and he's and we hear them talking to her husband and she's saying you know those people in that other booth they're like rabbits <laughs> uh, or words to that effect and <laughs> in other words they're cutting you down and then you feel who you just want to shrink and they go oh, they're talking about us forget it forget it they they don't answer to God. You answer to God. These every one of these children is in a wonderful blessing. Wonderful blessing. What do we read in in uh, where is it? Psalm 100 and and uh, can I find it now in a hurry? Uh, yeah, Psalm 120. The one, the one I think of is the one that says a man with many uh, arrows in his quiver. Yeah, Psalm 127. Uh, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, of Job. Does God, does God know what he's talking about? Does God know what he's talking about? These are the yes, words of God. 
children are an heritage of Jehovah, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of his youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Now, all of this is only going to be blessing and happiness if we are doing it God's way, if we're resting in Him, if we have an intense desire to obey Him. But if we're already in rebellion and we're kicking against the law of God, uh, which is happening everywhere we turn around, well, then we read this and we say, well, that's what God says, I don't buy it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, of course, it's not going to come true for us either because we are in rebellion uh, uh, in so many different ways already against God. But if we are, are, are listening to God and with a view to wanting to be obedient and we're just resting in his promises and, and, uh, and just waiting upon him, oh, yes, these are really true blessings. But thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. I have a question for you. Uh, according to you, the uh, Satan is in the church now. So if you did your show from a church, wouldn't it be true that your word is Satan? According no. to you, this is what you've been saying. Not Big answer up here. You'll have to say it again, but speak a little more slowly. Uh, uh, I, you're asking about this program? Go ahead. Ask it again. Oh, my. I wish we had not, had not lost that caller, but we, we, uh, maybe he can call back sometime. Shall we take our next call? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Well, I'm champion. Thank you for taking my call, sir. Yes. I, I want to, uh, to save this atheist soul. I, I'm that, sorry. Excuse me. Would you turn your radio off, please? We are getting. I, I did already. All right. I want to save this atheist person's soul who called in earlier. And I wanted to, to tell him about this incident that happened between me and my daughter when she was a year and eight months old. I called your station before and I've told you about this incident that happened between me and my daughter. And she said, said to me that she wanted to go back and live with Jesus at a year and eight months old, Reverend Champion. This man don't know what he's dealing with. He should get to know Christ. He haven't even tried to search him. So I just wanted to let him know that these words came from my daughter's mouth when she was a year and eight months old. And, and this is true. And I'm telling you this, and I'm trying to save this man's soul before it's too late. So well, I just thank want to you, you aren't going to save his soul. No one can save anybody's soul. God has to do the saving. We are grateful that he is listening to this program. And, and uh, maybe God will open his eyes and, and give him the uh, desire to really listen to the word of God more carefully. But we'll just pray for him. But we can't, we can't save his soul. We can't do anything to get him saved. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing your your experience. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Brother Campbell? Yes. I know God is a perfect God, but I like to get your comments on homosexuals and lesbians, and I take my ass over radio. Uh, now repeat your question. I want to, uh, I know God is a perfect God. Yes. I want to know about homosexuals and lesbians, where they come from. Well, homosexual, you see, mankind was created perfect at the very beginning, and we were all in the loins of Adam, that effectively we were, uh, we all started out as perfect beings, but we've rebelled against God, and we've become sinful, and our spiritually we are dead. Spiritually, we're dead both in body and soul. We're like a valley of dry bones. We still have a conscience, and God's law is written on our heart to some degree, so that we know uh, basically right from wrong. We uh, know when we sin. We know there is a God, and that we have to uh, answer to Him. These things we do know, even though we're spiritually dead 
And and in our spiritual deadness, uh, it means that we are capable of any kind of rebellion. Now, one of the areas where there is massive rebellion is in the sexual relationship. Uh, uh, this is a... a these, this body chemistry God has put within mankind is in order to enhance the marriage relationship. It's in order to uh, that uh, indeed uh, uh, the two individuals uh, will uh, be knit together much more tightly, and it'll also mean that that the children can be born to them, and so on. And from this, the human race comes. But man, in his rebellion. Uh, have have diverted all of this and are using these things only for their own uh, advantage and they don't care about the marriage institution and finally it's gone so got so bad and God predicted uh, this is absolutely a prediction in the Bible that it would happen just as it is today that homosexuality would become rampant all over the world and indeed, today we find that is looked upon as a, an alternate lifestyle rather than the grievous sin that it really is, that the Bible speaks of it as it being. And uh, this is uh, because of the, the dead, spiritually dead nature of man. It's only when God saves a person that he, uh, that is, gives him a new resurrected soul a brand new soul, which is an integral part of his personality, in which he, and in his new soul, he never wants to sin again. In his new soul, God dwells. In his new soul, he has eternal life. And then there are great changes in the lifestyle of that man, or that woman, or that child. And this can happen to a baby. It can happen to anybody at any time, uh, according to what God plans. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Oh, let me turn my radio down. Hold on. Yes. Cindy. Cindy, turn the radio down. Yes, please do. Um, Mr. Camping, uh, my question is, um, I'm, I'm, they say absent from the body, present with the Lord, if you are saved. But... um. What happens to those that uh, die that, that aren't saved? Like the, the, I know they don't go to hell. Do they lie asleep? Well, see, the problem is that physical death is separation of soul and body. We see that all the time because uh, at one point the, uh, the person has personality, even though they're in a coma, and there's still a certain personality there. There's the, the body is warm. Uh, and the breath of life is there. And then a moment later, the, body, the person stops breathing, the, per, the body begins to get cold, and all we have is a body. The soul, whatever, and we can't see the soul, we can't, uh, we can't draw a picture of the soul, we can't uh, even imagine in our thinking what a soul looks like. It's a spirit uh, essence of man, but it has left that body, whether a person is a believer or not a believer. And the body immediately begins to decay, and so it has to be put away in the ground somewhere uh, in order to, uh, because it, it is going to return to the dust. Now, what happened to the soul of that individual? In the case of the true believer, it was in his soul that at the moment God gave him a, a salvation, he received a brand new resurrected soul in which he had eternal life. And so, it means that at that instant, instantly in his soul, he finds a new residency. He's living with Christ in heaven uh, and because he, he cannot die in his soul. But now here's another person who's not saved. His soul leaves the body. What happens to that soul? And from everything we, we know that on the last day, I'm speaking about the things we know about, we know on the last day when Christ appears, that person is going to be resurrected as a complete personality, body and soul. His body is returned to the dust, and, and, and yet uh, his, he still, his body is going to be resurrected. No matter what happened to his body, it could have been 
cremated and, and, the, and the ashes spread all over the ocean, but it makes no difference. His body is going to be resurrected, and so will his soul be brought up from wherever it was. And from everything we can read in the Bible, the best we can find is that it, he goes down to a place of silence. The soul just can't be put in hell because there's no judgment yet. He first has to stand before the judgment throne of God and legally found, be found guilty for his crimes and his sins. And only then, as a whole personality, can he be cast into hell. So the best we can say is that his soul goes to a place of silence. Like we read in Psalm 115, I believe it is, where we read in verse 17, uh, uh, the dead that praise not Jehovah, neither any that go down into silence. Right. Um, well, my, my my question still is like um, I know what happens to the, to the unsaved, but as far as the saved, then we we do and it, heaven is there isn't really heaven yet either. It's just like hell; it's not created fully yet. Correct. Oh well, now heaven is there. God in, indwells heaven. God Christ came from heaven. Uh, uh, Enoch back in in Genesis was was ca- uh, caught up into heaven as a whole personality. Uh, Elijah went into heaven. Uh, both in body and soul. Heaven does exist. But hold on, I'll finish talking about this right after this message. When the Bible talks about heaven where God dwells, of course it is very mysterious. It is not, uh, we can't think of it in terms of what we see on the earth. On the earth, everything is measured by length and width and height, and then we have time as a as a fourth condition that by which we can measure whatever we have. But you can't measure heaven that way. Heaven is from eternity. Heaven is where God dwells. And it is something outside of our, uh, outside of our minds altogether. Our minds were never designed to contemplate what heaven is. But we know it does exist. We know that God dwells there. And we know that uh, when a person dies in his soul existence, he goes to heaven. That is all there. Now, on the other hand, hell, the, the first meaning of hell is to be under the wrath of God. Uh, it is not a place in the first instance. It is to be under the wrath of God. And so uh, that's why the Bible uh, uh, presents us with language that indicates that when Christ found us, that is, those that he came to save, he found us in hell. That is, we were under the wrath of God. We were not in a place called hell. We were simply, uh, theologically or spiritually, we were under the wrath of God. And now we have been freed from the wrath of God when we become saved. It's like we have been taken out of hell. Now, uh, the fact is that nobody can be committed to hell eternally as the Bible calls for. The Bible, as the law book, stipulates that the penalty for sin is eternal damnation in in hell, which is also called the lake of fire. But God cannot legally send anyone there until... There is a trial, and that trial will be uh, uh, right on the very end of the world. When Christ visibly appears again, he will appear as the judge, and all those who are, are not saved will have to stand individually before Christ to answer for their sins. They will legally be found guilty, and legally they will be consigned to hell. Well, at that time, God will have to create a place called hell or the lake of fire, and God uses other language to describe it, the bottomless pit, and, and so on. Uh, God, God uh, must, must uh, actually create such a place because... It has to be away from where all the true believers will be. By the same token, there's a creation going on insofar as this earth is concerned. This earth will 
in its present condition, this universe, the whole universe, will be destroyed by fire and be recreated. And it's recreated a different kind of a universe. It's a new heaven and a new earth. It will be a universe we can't even imagine because it will uh, it will not be heaven up there anymore and earth with its peak population down here. It will all be with Christ. It will be one universe, new heaven and new earth. And that is all future, and it will happen very shortly now because we've come so very close to the very end of time. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Uh, yeah, thanks for taking my call. Yes. And, uh, 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 it said that uh, in the Bible that on the last day the sun will be darkened. And I was wondering, is that li- literally the sun? I think I think we have to understand that spiritually, that uh, that on the last uh, right at the that right up until Christ appears, God will still be saving, and then suddenly He appears and salvation program has come to an end. Everyone that God yeah, twi- had elected twinkling. to salvation had become saved. And so the sun no longer shines. That is the sun of the gospel, uh, oh, ready okay. to save. All right. Uh, oh, and I had another que- question that uh, uh, that uh, I can't remember where it is now in the Bible. That uh, it says something like, uh, "The first shall be last, and the last shall be first." Uh, I thought that had to do with the uh, resurrection of the, you know, give, receiving a new body. And, uh, but then I, I remember there was something that uh, the ones that had died and gone to heaven to be with Christ, they're the ones that received their body, new res, new uh, glorified yeah. bodies first. Yeah. And then yeah. the Actually, people. it doesn't have anything to do with that. It oh. has to do with God's plan of, uh, as he unfolds the salvation program into the world throughout time. Now, for 1955 years, beginning in A.D. 33, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, as we read about it in Acts 2, God has been designing and building or uh, has encouraged people to, uh, to be part of a local congregation, and they have been sprinkled all through the world. And they are the first ones. They are part of the of the, uh, what's the word, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the initial uh, harvest, the, uh, the first fruits, that's the word I'm looking for. They are the first fruits that have come in. And, uh, and uh, the, quite a number of people have become saved in this way. But as we come to the final harvest, which we are presently in, we find that there is a great number of people who have never, never heard the gospel before. Fact is, if we go to the World Almanac just to get some ideas about this, we find that the world is approaching 7 billion people, and about one-third call themselves Christian in some way, and about two-thirds have no, know nothing about Christianity. And that is, they are totally oblivious to the fact of the Bible and the, the fact of Christ and so on. Now, the, the one-third that call themselves Christian, they are a product of the evangelistic efforts of the churches throughout the last 1,955 years. And so uh, there are quite a number of believers amidst them, although as we really look at the biblical declaration of the of the spiritual condition of the churches at this time in history and the bible has a lot to say about it we find that the number of true believers in these churches is only a tiny remnant and so they even though as a whole congregation they were first yet because they 
Uh, most of them in the churches are not saved. They are last. It's like they had never heard the gospel. They are last. On the other hand, outside of the churches, we're now blanketing the world with the gospel, and and uh, virtually anybody is uh, within a range of being able to hear the true gospel. And out of those who have the two-thirds of the world that have never never heard the gospel in prior years god they are the last ones and many 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 of them are going to be first that is there's a great multitude which no man can number that will come into salvation and when we come into salvation we align ourselves with those who are first and so this statement that is repeated several times in the new testament is is uh, being attested to today as we see the great number of people who are who are not listening to the whole bible and yet they are are trusting in their churches and yet we know that outside of the churches there's a hungering for truth and uh, we don't we don't know where all these people are that are going to be uh, that are now the last and will be first. That's God's business. We aren't able to bring them together in any kind of a crusade or any kind of a meeting house of any kind. We don't have to do that. We know they are being brought together individually into the kingdom of God itself. And God is in charge of that, and he knows each and every one that is being brought into that kingdom, each one who had been last and who now is the first. Do you know how many languages there are on the earth? Well, yes. There's uh, No, I don't know. There's probably a thousand. If we took all the dialects and so on, there might be a couple of thousand dialects and languages and so on. Uh, but it's very significant. You know that God has been uh, preparing the world for this time. I think, for example, of of China. There's a there's about a almost a quarter of the world's population, and a hundred years ago it was split up into hundreds of different dialects and languages, and then God raised up Mao Zedong and uh, a communist leader and dictator. And he decided that all of China ought to have one language. And so everybody in mainland China is able to understand the the, uh, Chinese language, one of the... uh, uh, the uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, languages that was dominant at the time he came into power, and that remains there in all of mainland China. So we don't have to try to broadcast into uh, uh, 200 different dialects in order to reach the people of China. We just have to broadcast in one or two languages. The same is true in in many other countries in South America, Spanish or Portuguese becomes the dominant language. And, and except for some of the very elderly people, uh, almost everybody is being schooled in either Spanish or, or Portuguese or, or English, one of the three or maybe two of the three. And, uh, and so it almost... Uh, uh, God, in other words, God is doing a lot of pre- preparation so that we don't have to publish the, bo- the gospel in 2,000 different languages. Now, we are uh, working real hard to try to add language after language, and we've started in family radio. We've started with the largest language groups, which is Chinese and then English, and then going down from there, now we've added about 30 uh, languages all together, and and we're pressing on. Uh, maybe before Christ returns, we might have be able to broadcast as many as fifty or a hundred. I have no idea. Whatever God is allows us to do, but we do know that every time we add another language, there are millions of more people who potentially can hear the gospel in their own language. Well, thank you, and may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. Thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Uh, I'd like to see if you could read Leviticus uh, 34, please. Leviticus 34. I'm sorry, chapter 23, verse 34. 
Oh, Leviticus 23, verse 24. 34. 34, okay. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 23, verse 34. 23. And there we read, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto Jehovah. Now, what is that? And also the uh, verse 39 also. And verse 39? Yes. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when ye are gathering in the fruit of the land. Notice I changed the verb a little bit there because it's more cl- close to the Hebrew there. Instead of saying have gathered, it is when ye are gathering in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto Jehovah seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Now, my question is, Brother Camping, is that it says in uh, verse 34 that there should be no customary work uh, done on that day. And then in 39, it says on the, also on the 15th day when you have gathered in the fruits of the land. Now, is that considered doing work on the same day? Well, in, in the 15th day shall be for uh, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. The first day shall be a holy convocation. Seven days ye shall offer an offering by fire unto Jehovah. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation. In other words, the first and the eighth day are, are to be observed like they are a Sabbath. All right, but also then verse 39 says, Also on the fifteenth day, it says, When you have gathered in the fruit of the land. So isn't gathering the fruit of the land uh, considered doing work? Well, now we have to bear in mind. Well, it's it's you you're not you're not going to be gathering on that day if that's a holy convocation, but the feast itself is seven days long, and so during the next day you you proceed with that. As a matter of fact, uh, the our gathering really comes into uh, into a real play when we look at the spiritual meaning of this, because the Feast of Tabernacles is pointing to the very time in which we are living and in which we are gathering in the harvest of the land. So they're not saying gathering in on the day of the 15th day. You're not gathering on the 15th day, because that would be you know, contradictory to verse 34. And I know there's really no contradictions in the Bible. No. <clears throat> well, thank you for calling and sharing. Thank you. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Harold. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Harold, in John 6, John chapter 6. Yes. Uh, the Lord uses the phrase, the last day, four times. And before he uses that phrase it says raise him up so he's talking about the last day of the end of the world judgment day is that correct yes in that case he is talking about that case the context clearly shows he is talking about the last day of the history of the world when christ appears on the clouds of glory and it's the time when the believers are raptured and the unsaved are ready to stand for their turn at the judgment throne of God. Okay, could we look at John 7, chapter, uh, verse 37? And in there we find the, the last day, in the last day, that great day of the feast. And when we work through that very carefully, we'll find that the last day has to do with the whole period of, uh, of the great tribulation that we are presently are in. What, what 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 feast is he making reference to there? The great day of the feast. The 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 feast he's making reference to is the feast of tabernacles or the feast of ingathering, which is an integral part of the the you see what's happening here in John seven. It begins with the beginning of the first day of the seventh month, and then transitions into this feast of tabernacles, and and it is anticipating. God's plan for the sending the gospel out into the world. Uh, it, uh, it requires that the Holy Spirit would be poured out, the gospel would go out, and then there would be an ingathering which would, uh, which would uh, uh, 
come to its culmination during the last day or judgment day, which actually includes, in this context, the whole the whole period that uh, uh, judgment began uh, during, during uh, and includes the last 23 years of the history of the world, whereas the last day, insofar as God's salvation and ingathering uh, goes, it includes all the all of the final 17 years of the history of the world. And then in, in John 12, he mentions it one more time, 1248, the yes. last day. That's like six, seven, six times. Yes. He, and there in John 1248, he is, uh, he is uh, uh, well, it, it's a little bit ambiguous in John 1248. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, the last day has two meanings. It can be the very last day of the history of the world. It can mean the last day which incorporates all of the 23 years that okay, the great uh, that end with the end of the world. It's just like God does the same thing, incidentally, in Genesis. In Genesis 1, God uses the word day. There was evening and morning, day one. And evening and morning, day two. He, does, he says that seven times. Right. And then he comes to the next uh, few verses, and he speaks about in the day, still singular, in right. the day that Christ cre- that God created the heavens and the earth. And so he's using that same word day in a singular way and speaking about all seven days, uh, the six days of creation and the day that Christ rested. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, that gives us uh, uh, permission and shows us how God writes. That when, that when he uses that term last day, it can be the whole 23 years of the final end of the world, or it can be in the day when Christ appears on the clouds of glory, and we have to look at the context to know which is in view. One more question, please. Uh, Psalm 115, verse 17, makes reference to the dead going down into silence. Yes. Do you have any knowledge of any other scripture in the Bible that makes reference to that place of silence? No, I'm not aware of any that uh, that speaks about that at all. It's uh, uh, God just leaves that alone right there. Okay. And, and so, Thank you, as brother. As far as what I know presently. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, camping. Yes. Uh, I believe last night you were speaking you know, a little bit about uh, 40, number 40 being in the Bible a lot. Yeah. And it's mostly about testing. Now, I don't think you've ever mentioned it, but uh, speaking of the, the fig tree coming in bloom in 1948, 40 years later, which would be our testing period, is 1988, and the 2300 hour starts, which would be the judgment. Do you see it that way? Yeah, it, I, yeah, I can see it that way. I, 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 and certainly it is a truism. We can't deny that, that mm-hmm. uh, there were exactly 40 years. We know that. And uh, so we, uh, yes, we can then say, yes, uh, that was a testing program for yeah. who? For who? Well, we know it was a testing program for the nation of Israel, certainly, because they're the nation that came into leaf. And, and yet, after 40 years, they were still in rebellion against Christ as their Messiah, just as greatly as they had ever been in their history. Uh, and also, in a real sense, it was a testing time for the people in the churches, because at the end of 40 years, of that 40 years, the whole uh, uh, business came to a halt because God's wrath came down on the churches and he was finished with them made a lot of bad decisions that's in my lifetime falling farther away from the truth that's in that testing period without the grace of God we fall right away yes can I ask one more question please in in Revelation uh, 17 yes okay you you can start around about the, the ten horns 
making war against the Lamb, and they will give their power to the beast for one hour. In the past, God always judged his, his people, mostly the Jews in Israel. He always used other pagan countries or unsaved people to punish them. Basically, that's how he would use it. He would use other people sometimes. Do you think possibly for the one hour, God, to punish his church, is raising up all the unsaved world and other religions no. to despise no. the church? No, no, no. They've been around all the time. That has not changed. Uh, what has happened is in 1988, there's something far more drastic happened. And that is God loosed to Satan, mm -hmm. who al has always been uh, hammering away at the churches. He's right. been able to sow them with terrors and get people in there who looked like they were true believers and yet were still servants of Satan. But Christ was still ruling. And, and, uh, and uh, there was very severe limits as to how far Satan could go in enticing people into wickedness either in the churches or outside of the churches but from everything we can know in the bible in 1988 when the end of the church age come came god loosed satan and gave him the full spiritual rule of each and every local congregation that's an enormous change full spiritual rule christ Abandon the churches. The Holy Spirit no longer is there to save anybody. And uh, so anybody left in the churches who uh, think they're serving Christ spiritually actually are serving Satan spiritually, whether they like Amen. it or not. And, and also, that's, why, I, that's why they're commanded to get out of there. Also, I use the, uh, the, the free will interpretation that all the churches like to use in Revelation 17:17. 17, 17. It has, for God, has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So that takes all free will right out of these people's hands. Well, it, 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 with any of the doctrines that are contrary to the word of God. And remember, we read in Second uh, Thessalonians 2 that God gives them a strong delusion to right. make them believe a lie. And so it's not, it's not very good at all in the churches. God is against them, and he is, uh, he's not neutral. He is sending a strong delusion. He has put Satan there to have the spiritual rule. And, uh, and uh, 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 he is, uh, those who are not elect are, and that, it doesn't mean that, there are, that everybody in the churches that remain there today are not elect. I believe there are still those who are elect, and before it all is over, they will be driven out or will realize they have to get out. We have to wait upon God for that. But, but the, the preponderance of the people apparently appear to be as if they're going to remain there all the way, but we can't know for sure how, how all of this will be. But, uh, but we don't... It's very sad. We've already gone down... Uh, uh, 18 years of, uh, since the Great Tribulation began. And the number of people who have left the churches have been fairly minuscule. It's been a fairly small number. And that's very, uh, very discouraging. Uh, I'm thankful that from time to time we'll read a statement in the Bible that says, no, there's still going to be people coming out. I can find those statements in the Bible. And that is a great encouragement because all of us have loved ones and friends that we love dearly who have not had their spiritual eyes opened yet. And we're praying and beseeching the Lord that they too might see the truth and come out. But with that, I have to say good night. We've come to the end of our program. And until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. <laughs> 